I'm Gerhard Lazu, and you're listening to ShipIt.show, a podcast about ops, infrastructure, and developer experience. I'm wondering, in your company, who designs the end-to-end developer experience? From design to implementation, what is the developer experience that you actually ship? Even though the average developer wastes almost half of their working hours because of bad DX, many of us don't even know what that means or how to improve it. Kenneth Oceanberg is working at Stripe, building economic infrastructure for the internet. I found his perspective on developer experience infrastructure refreshingly simple as well as very useful. Big thanks to our partners Fastly and Fly. This MP3 is served with minimal latency from the Fastly Edge location, which is closest to you. Our app and database run on Fly.io because it keeps things simple. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Fire Hydrant. Fire Hydrant is a reliability platform for every developer. Incidents are a win, not an if situation, and they impact everyone in the organization, not just SREs. And I'm here with Robert Ross, founder and CEO of Fire Hydrant. Robert, what is it about teams getting distracted by incidents and not being able to focus on the core product that upsets you? I think that incidents bring a lot of anxiety and sometimes fear and maybe even a level of shame that can cause this paralysis in an organization from progress. And when you have the confidence to manage incidents at any scale of any variety, everyone just has this breath of fresh air that they can go build the core product even more. I don't know if anyone's had the the opportunity, maybe is the word, uh, to call the fire department. But no matter what, when the fire department shows up, it doesn't matter if the building is hugely on fire. They are calm, cool, and collected because they know exactly what they're going to do. And that's what Fire Hydrant is built to help people achieve. Very cool. Thank you, Robert. If you want to operate as a calm, cool, collected team when incidents happen, you got to check out Fire Hydrant. Small teams up to 10 people can get started for free with all the features. No credit card required to sign up. Get started at firehydrant.com. Again, firehydrant.com. We are going to ship in three, two, one. Kenneth, welcome to Ship It. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So in August, you wrote this blog post that caught my attention. The title was Developer Experience Infrastructure. And it wasn't the infrastructure part that caught my attention. It resonated with me at a deeper level since I think for the majority of the last decade, my work was for other developers. Or at least that's what I think. Uh, What is developer experience infrastructure? What does it mean? So I worked on that blog post and it was really like a more an internal process for me to kind of put my, 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 my reflections into a blog post because I've been looking at, at our industry more broadly and saying, we've been talking about developer platforms, developer experience, but I've really been, been trying to like put a label on some of the observations I've seen in, in the industry. And developer experience infrastructure is, is what I describe as this new emerging infrastructure company that really enables anyone, regardless whether you are a small company or a large company, to really like uh, provide industry-leading developer experience uh, and and developer offerings to your customers. So in in a sense, it's really this new emerging layer with all the table stakes things you need to provide today to provide a, a great developer experience and really all the packaging that you need to serve developers. Okay, so is this just a very nice word for products where developers are the end users? You could say that, but like, I think you need to like, take a step back, we can look at like, I'm building a SDK and I'm building a CLI, that's for developers. Is that developer experience infrastructure? I would say it's not, but it's part of the recipe. Really, this is a similar perspective you can apply on like cloud infrastructure Mm -hmm. in the sense that we went from being in our own uh, Data, uh, data, uh, data centers, we all had to buy the hardware and operate things. And now we've moved to a cloud-native world. 
what I see around like developer experience in our industry is that I'm kind of seeing seeing the same is that it has become so complicated. I want to say complicated, but the market demands for you providing a great developer experience has become like really like the bar has been set so high that you as a small company or even a medium sized company cannot build those pieces anymore. So this is really like a part of like uh, the maturization of the market that instead of you building everything in-house, now we reach this maturity point in the market where there's actually a lot of like table stake solutions you can go up, up, you can buy off the shelf that you can use to provide a part of your developer experience to your customers. So in the sense that if I'm building, let's say I, I have a weather company and I want to have an API that provides the weather data, should you go out and build your, your own infrastructure and how you provide documentation, SDKs, other aspects or, or, or in 2022 or 2023 as we look into the future, would you go out and buy some of those solutions from, from companies that have been specialized in that? Mm -hmm. Are there companies that focus solely on developer experience infrastructure? Can you think of a few examples just to make it clear? Yeah, like there's actually quite a few as a part of my blog post. I kind of also been working on I'm putting together what I call the developer experience infrastructure market map, where I talk, trying to break out the market in the different players. And, and like I, I see a lot of, a lot of broad categories as I like can a category around documentation and like SDKs. And there you have like, I think the chronicle example is readme.com. If you go to a lot of like um, documentation pages for, for smaller companies, you're basically seeing them using readme. And there's uh, API Matic, Stoplight, Redogly. There's a lot of players out there that are providing various aspects. Even when you look at like on the API infrastructure, I would say that there's players like Speakeasy API, uh, Kong is probably a more established player, Optic. There's quite a few, few, few of these companies that are providing elements of like what I describe as developer experience infrastructure. But to answer your question, there's no Chronicle company that is like providing the full end-to-end -end solution. There's no kind of like AWS of developer experience. It's more of these sub-components that you stitch together uh, yourself to kind of build your developer experience. Because that's exactly what I was thinking. Like these are typically the things that we would maybe go to AWS for. And then AWS with all its services, you get all the infrastructure that you need to build great developer experience without having to reinvent every single component. The cloud native landscape is a little bit like that, but maybe that's maybe too technical because I know that you have something else in mind. So would you say that AWS is developer experience infrastructure where you go and you pick mix and match services and you build a great developer experience? I probably look at it through a, a different layer and that like you can go to one of the big cloud providers like AWS, Azure, GCP, and they kind of provide like your cloud infrastructure layer, your compute, your storage, probably your auth, those pieces. But the reality is that you can use those services. Let's say I spin up like a new API, I use a, a, like API gateway, some lambdas, and then I have my API. But developer experience infrastructure is really like going from the 80% that AWS gave you to the 100%. It's the documentation, it's the SDKs, it's the community building, it's the API reference, it's the developer uh, portal. It's all those pieces that current cloud providers are not providing today. And kind of like my hypothesis and my argument I'm making in my DXI blog post is that I believe this is a new emerging infrastructure category where we have roughly like a billion dollars invested in emerging startups and um, that are starting to kind of fill the gaps that in the past has been developed in-house. I think all of us, in particular you, you have been in the industry for so long, like we all have been in-house, we're just rolling our in-house in solution. But now we're seeing these kind of like each individual component starting to be complicated, advanced, et cetera, that you cannot build them in-house anymore. And now some of these startups or even medium-sized companies are starting to lift some of that responsibility. Yeah, I think I was thinking more around like the tooling, the internal tooling that maybe developers were using, for example, a pass. So I was working for a couple of years uh, on a pass called Cloud Foundry, which developers would use to build, you know, the, basically to run their applications and building would be doing a couple of things. The other one was RabbitMQ, but that was like very specific to queues and queuing. And I think that was like more like a developer tool 
in a way, like a, a building block, if you wish. Uh, Dagger, my current role, I think that's more like uh, inline because that's that's how I even reached out to you because we talk a lot about DX. What is a DX that you want the tool to have so that others can build pipelines really easily? This is more like a primitive that works across any system that you have. And I think that that's that's where my interest was peaked when I heard you talk about DXI because Solomon talks a lot about DX. So what is the difference between DX, developer experience, and developer experience infrastructure? Got it. I, 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 before answering that question, I just want to continue the, the riff here because I, I think you have an important point. When we think about developer experience, we, is, we can think about, like I would say, like in two broad core categories. We have internal developer experience, which I probably would categorize and same as like what, what in the past we've been calling developer productivity. And then we kind of have external uh, developer experience in the sense that what are the experiences like API first or co developer first companies are providing and how they're offering those products to their users. And I think when, when we say developer experience and developer experience infrastructure, I think there's like two sides to the equation. For a company, like if you are a company that are developer first, you care about your internal developer experience and how you're building your own products, but you also care about the external element. But for many companies, developer experience is just the internal developer experience because they're not having a developer angle or, or maybe something else. So I think like, what is the difference? Let's start by like, uh, with some definitions, kind of the, the, the way I've been framing developer experience, because that's also like part of, if you think about our industry, is that everything is suddenly developer experience, right? It's like developer advocacy is now developer experience. Developer productivity is now, is, is, is now developer experience. And, and the way I kind of been, been, been coining it for, for myself is that to me, developer experience is that holistic experience, uh, that is offered to developers throughout that life cycle it means to interact with your product. Developer experience is not just the SDK or the API, but it's much broader than that. It's kind of the journey that we take developers through. And what we are trying to do as, as a companies in our industry is we're trying to make that experience as good as possible, as smooth as, as possible. So really, that's, that's what DX is to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's DX. And what about DXI? We have the two acronyms, the DX and the DXI. So we have the DX explanation. What about the DXI? Right. So, so like, if you think about like DX as kind of that holistic experience, to me, DXI, so the, that's the infrastructure piece, that's the products and services that kind of fits into that holistic experience. So they're the kind of like, they're the, the infrastructure layer that enables the holistic developer experience. Whether, whether it is that I am you, I'm providing an internal developer experience, then I'm using services, libraries, abstractions to have help with that experience. I'm, I'm focused on, I'm running an API first company and I need to provide like the services uh, to enable that external developer experience. So this is all the infrastructure pieces that you are using and stitching together to provide that holistic developer experience. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so why is it important? Why is the developer experience and the developer experience infrastructure, why are they important? For, for a lot of different reasons, like kind of like um, you can apply a lot of different aspects to, hey, why does it matter like the experience we're providing to developers? In the same realm as like, why is it important for, for you to have a well-designed product to your end users? You could argue that if you are building a product targeted developers, or you have a developer-faced offering in parallel to your consumer, your B2B offering, it's like your DX, that's kind of like your UX is your bread and butter in terms of that journey and, and you're providing to developers. So it's really, really important for you that you have an as optimized experience to make your developers happy. If you have like an API and it doesn't have a great developer experience, like you're probably not going to see a lot of adoption. You're not going to see a lot of satisfaction. You're going to see a, a heck of a lot of developers probably being forced to make this into integration with your system, but it's not going to be a great experience. I also think you can apply another, another angle on this. And that's really like more like a financial economic perspective. And this is really like developer productivity is really, really expensive. And it like in my original blog post, I kind of referenced like a report that Stripe did back in, in 2018, um, really looking at developer productivity is that the average work week for, for developers around like, let's say 40 hours, but developers actually spend a significant portion of their time dealing with bad code, technical debt. And with the investments we are making into our engineering teams, 
that's really, really expensive. And what we at Stripe really quantified is that over a 10 year period, we see that as a trillion dollar opportunity to really like uh, in, in, G, in GDP growth to optimize a developer experience and make it easier and better for developers because we can make building solutions uh, more productive. Yeah. So I'm looking at this pie chart right now. It says average developer work week, 41.1 total hours. We could round it down to 40. That's a good one. Out of that, 13.5. So more than a third is technical debt. Interesting. Or about a third is technical debt. There's the developer coefficient. This was September 2018. 3.8 hours is bad code. So I wouldn't say half, but almost half of the average developer work week is spent on technical debt and bad code. How has this changed over time? So since 2018, has there been another study? So I don't have additional data points from, from the Stripe perspective terms of what we have uh, collected, but I think we as an industry, just anecdotally think about our industry, I think we have seen a massive investment into developer experience and developer productivity in broad terms. And I think as we kind of got gone through like the on-prem kind of era to now cloud native world, I do think we, we have seen a significant investment and a lot of paradigm shifts into how we are building software. So I did I like my hypothesis here would be that I definitely think we have gotten into a better spot, but just like based on like how I see engineering teams operate, et cetera, I still think we have a very long way to go. And I think if you, if, if you think about our industry in broad terms, like, um, we are somewhat still a new industry that is learning how to build software. And I think a lot of the processes and how we are working are still somewhat new. And we as an industry are collectively learning every single day and how we actually build this thing we call software. So I also think there's an element of just the maturity cycle in terms of what we do as an industry and then how we can actually as an industry move the needle, make us ourselves more productive uh, through the abstractions, developer tools and as such we provide. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I could definitely see that. So for someone that's wondering what are the components of DX, what goes into developer experience? So we talked, it's not just the code. It's not just the documentation. There's a lot more. What are the components in your mind for DX? I kind of see it as a life cycle in a, in a journey, so to say, right? Like we think about like, if you think like I am joining, I'm looking for payments API. Hey, I, I'm, I'm biased because I work for a company called Stripe, right? Like there's definitely the element of like content, blog post, like how, how, how do I discover content? Then there's a documentation aspect. Hey, how do I get educated about the product that I want to use? And then there's the whole product aspect, the APIs, the, the SDKs, the tools, the abstractions, the, the error messages, all those pieces. And then there's also the community element in terms of like, how do I interact with the product teams? How do I get a sense of like the community I'm a part of? How do I engage with the teams? All those other pieces. So I think in broad terms, I can kind of look at this as a life cycle. And that's really also like to my previous point about this is a holistic experience. When you interact with a developer facing product, you, if you have like an amazing developer community, but your product experience is not great, it's not a great holistic developer experience. It really has to all to come together for you to having that industry-leading developer experience. I have to say, I've definitely seen it with Stripe. It's one of the products and one of the components that we get to use, right? Many of us get to use. That works really well from so many perspectives. The code itself, the error messages, the documentation, even the community. There is like a lot of, not to mention examples, content. There's so much content, so much Stripe content, whether you want to integrate with it, whether you need help with it. There's just so much out there. And I can see this is an example of good DX. And I want to believe that you had something to do with it. I, I would definitely say that I have a tiny part in, in terms of like... Uh, uh, the developer experience we provide uh, at Stripe. So, so just to to, to like uh, to do more like a formal introduction. Uh, these days, I'm I'm a product manager at Stripe. So I I really joined Stripe to to look after pieces of our, our developer experience. I was really focused on our product developer experience, on the developer tools, the CLIs, SDKs, our dashboards, all of that. And um, these days, I'm 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 leading a team uh, building Stripe apps. 
uh, that is really like the application layer we have been launched uh, earlier this year on top of Stripe to really enable developers to kind of truly build new experiences and integrations on top of us. I think like a, a good good parallel would be that uh, think of your iPhone is that uh, before we launched Stripe apps or all, all the experiences you had in Stripe, they were pre-installed and built by Stripe. Now we kind of enabled an app ecosystem uh, on top of us to kind of build these n- new new set of experiences. But even before my time at Stripe, I also happened to spend a few years at Microsoft building developer tools. I worked on, on Visual Studio Code and a few other JavaScript tools. And then in, in, in way back when, uh, when I did engineering, I spent roughly a decade in and out of startups in, in Europe, uh, mainly doing front-end in engineering. So that's kind of like a short pitch of myself. But at Stripe, we have multiple teams thinking about our developer experience. Uh, so that is covering our docs teams, our docs product teams that think about docs as a product. We have our developer experience teams, our API teams, etc. So it's definitely like um, a larger team of us that are really thinking about that holistic developer experience. And as a part of my, my blog post, there's some of the observations I've been pl- plotting down and sharing in terms of like what I'm considering industry leading developer experience is definitely biased from, from my time at Stripe and some of the observations I've, I've seen in terms of like, what does it actually take to provide a, a the developer experience Stripe is providing today? Mm, I see. So you've been at Stripe for a few years now, right? I'm looking at your blog post that was joining Stripe 2019, I believe. Yeah, time time flies. It's, it's almost the end of 2022 now, yeah. Yeah. What, 2020? I don't know what happened. 2021, again, like, it was like a weird one. 2022 is like only like when everything came rushing, right? Because there were two years on pause. So what was it like for you to be part of Stripe for the last three years? What was it like to work there? Stripe is a pretty amazing place in the sense that when I joined back in, yeah, 2019, time flies. We were a much smaller company in terms of where we are now, but I would say like I've never seen a a set of founders and a set of people that are so passionate about long term thinking and thinking infrastructure. And I'm I've been really really grateful uh, to be a part of, of of these teams that we have built that are really thinking uh, with a rigorous attention to detail. I've never seen it anywhere in before one. I, I came from Microsoft and I think we did a pretty good job in terms of building developer tools, et cetera. Just like the, the level of thinking and just like uh, uh, the caliber of people that have been working on a lot of different things has definitely been a big eye opener to me. And then doing like uh, the, the peak of the pandemic, like I remember like, when, when the pandemic started and, and we all like had to go remote and we were experiencing massive like adoption because suddenly the whole world went online, right? Yeah. So it's, it's been a really, really interesting journey. In particular, like working on payments, which I'd never, never worked on in the past because I am, I'm, 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 my bread and butter is, is developers. So it's been, been a really interesting journey um, to also kind of like go up, I would say like up a different abstraction ladder. Uh, in the past, like I, I worked on, on foundational developer tools like VS Code and TypeScript, working on like cloud infrastructure. And then going kind of up the abstraction ladder and working on on payments infrastructure that is kind of a vertical on on top of like the more foundational layer I was in the past. So it's it's been a really, really fun, fun learning journey. And I I do think like when when I think about Stripe as a platform is that kind of the irony is like when I joined in 19, it's like it's still early. And I do think Stripe has a lot of interesting things that we can do with the platform going forward. Okay, okay. This episode is brought to you by Sentry. Build better software faster, diagnose, fix, and optimize the performance of your code. More than a million developers in 68,000 organizations already use Sentry, and that includes us. Here's the easiest way to try Sentry. Head to sentry.io slash demo slash sandbox. That is a fully functional version of Sentry that you can poke at. And best of all, our listeners get the team plan for free for three months at Sentry.io and use the code SHIP IT when you sign up again. Sentry.io and use the code SHIP IT. (laughs) 
So from a DX and DXI perspective, since that is the context of this discussion, can you give us some specifics at Stripe from the last three years that helped shape some of your thinking? Yeah, like I think like a, a very tangible example is that when you run like an API first company, um, you tend to think about a lot about like my documentation or my API reference and thinking that, hey, that's where most of your developers are going to figure out how, how you consume your API. But the key insight is that developers actually don't care that much about your API, but they care a lot more about your SDKs and the native kind of experience you are providing in the programming languages that, that you are using. Which I, I think is a fallacy to kind of think, oh, I'll just have a great API ref and then these SDKs, people can just do some curl commands. That actually means that if you don't care about that kind of product experience you're providing to developers and frankly, the SDKs you're providing when you're building, uh, having a, a, a infrastructure company, that's probably the most tangible thing developers will get from you as a company because the API is just transport. So like, what is the shape and the design of those SDKs? And also how much thinking that goes into like, how do we actually ensure that you have a consistent experience across all the different languages? And where do you intentionally want to carve out an area and saying, what do we need to do for a different Java versus Go, right? So really thinking about those pieces as like an intentional product with a strategy and sort of like where you want to invest, I, I think that has been a key insight, but also that the kind of like, which kind of ties me back to my old days at Microsoft, but like, it's very easy when we talk about developer experience and we talk about like the bleeding edge that we always think about like the newest hip thing, but really like what truly matters and is a long tail. And it's like what I think some people are calling like the gray matter developers, the PHP people of the world that is not using any like fancy development stack, but they still represent I'm not making up a number. Somebody please correct me out there. Like 42% uh, of the internet, there's still a large proportion of how the internet is actually put together. So how do you strike that balance between you making sure that you are relevant in like the denos of the world and being hip, but also that you, you actually uh, enable the bread and butter of your business and help like people that just want to build a product and move them, them forward too with the tools you provide. So I think like, for you to think about like uh, the bread and butter developers, it requires, at least it required me personally to work at a, diff at a certain scale like Stripe or Microsoft for you to kind of see the dynamics at, at play. If you're just a small startup and you're just trying to get to market and with your product, your usual audience is not that kind of segment, but you see that as you scale. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Now, I know that the infrastructure has many different meanings. And when I think of infrastructure, the default meaning that I go to is the hardware, right? Like the, all the hardware that runs things. But I think that when you think of infrastructure, you have a completely different image in mind. That's interesting in terms of like, I probably think about infrastructure in a different way, but like, I want to play it back to you uh, to really understand like, what do you mean by infrastructure and how do you make the connection between infrastructure and hardware? Yeah. So infrastructure is all the things that you rely on to run your code. So you wrote some code. What are the components that need to be in place for that code to provide value to end users? In this case, to me, that would be servers, or let's say we have serverless, it doesn't matter, there's some APIs that I integrate with to get my code out there. It would be all the pipelines, it would be everything that ensures that my code, which is locally, makes it in front of end users. All of that I think of as infrastructure. To narrow it down, right, it could be a pass, it could be uh, maybe some Kubernetes there, but it's not the only thing because that's like, there's like layers and layers of things that help run the code, right? I don't think about network switches most of the time or routers, but I know they're there. I don't think about ethernet cables and all those things or, you know, fiber optics, hopefully, but I know they're there. DNS, right? It's always DNS. Uh, there's like so many layers and layers of infrastructure that deliver whatever I'm building to end users. It makes basically the connection. But I'm mostly thinking from hardware perspective, systems perspective. I know that many people, when they hear infrastructure, 
they think about something reliable, something that they can build on top of. And it doesn't have to be of a certain type. It just means something I can trust to get the job done. And the job varies and the thing that I trust varies based on the job. So how do you think of infrastructure? I actually think, I think in infrastructure in the same way in terms of like it being like pieces of like components that you can leverage to kind of build the experience that you want to provide. But I probably don't have a tight connection between infrastructure and hardware in the sense that I see that as an abstraction ladder. Like, let's say that I want to build like a pass today that like you will probably rely on another computing abstraction that you're using that is so far away from hardware anyway that you have a virtual machines on some sort. You have another runtime. So even as you kind of compose kind of like a new kind of computing abstractions as infrastructure, hardware for you anyway is abstracted away. So when, when I think about infrastructure in a DX or in a software context is that if we think about how I'm composing a modern, let's say, software as a service business, I probably need some sort of compute layer. I probably need like a Vercel, a Netlify, or like AWS Lambda, or how I'm putting my, my stack together. But at the same time, I probably need an authentication piece that is not a hardware piece, but it's a, it's a set of services I'm using to provide auth, right? Or maybe even I'm using a combined provider that does all it for me, like Firebase. So what I mean by that is that to me, infrastructure is like the business components that you're leveraging to kind of put your product together. Mm -hmm. And the argument I'm making for DXI as a category is that we have, we reached this maturity point where if you have to provide all the aspects of a great modern developer experience covering your product, docs, content, community. You cannot build it in-house anymore. You have to rely on these new infrastructure pieces that are emerging from this new market landscape of companies saying, I want to be the best in providing SDKs. I want to be the best in providing documentation uh, infrastructure. I want to be the best in doing community management. And then I as the founder, I as the C-level at a company, instead of like, sitting with my budget and saying, should I allocate a hundred engineers to build internal developer experience? No, you know what? I would rather like use a different part of my budget and use a vendor for these kind of things. So it's through that, that lens that I'm seeing in infrastructure. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, that, that ties a lot of things together. So going back to Stripe and the work that you do, what does infrastructure mean in the context of Stripe for you? So in a sense, like tying it to what we provide as Stripe, is we provide payments infrastructure. So as overall, as a company, we are providing the platform primitives and the experiences uh, around payments for you to operate a modern business. Whether that is you're coming to Stripe to do just payments because I need to accept credit cards or uh, some payment method in the world, or I'm doing banking or I'm doing capital because I want to do a lending product or I want to run a marketplace, a two-sided marketplace, and Stripe has various product offerings that we are providing as platform primitives that you can kind of plug into your product. So you don't have to worry about all the financial complexity. We kind of abstract that away. In particular, in terms of what I do and like these days, I'm really hyper-focused on thinking in, in platform primitives and extensibility in terms of like through the products we are offering as Stripe, what are the pieces and the primitives we can provide so you can build the next kind of generation product on top of our platform and really about like opening up our platform. So all the primitives we have available internally, how can I make them available to you externally so you can consume them and stitch kind of new product experiences together? Whether that is like I install an app that is synchronizing data between some accounting system and Stripe, or I want to build a whole new kind of experience that runs natively on Stripe. So th th those are the things that I'm really obsessed with. I do think that we can also think more, more broadly about what some of the teams at here at Stripe are providing, and that's that's our, our developer experience. It's our SDKs, it's our API abstractions, it's the design patterns that our products is built upon. It is the supporting tools like the Stripe CLI, uh, or it's the integration of Stripe in editors like Visual Studio Code. So we have a, a bunch of different teams that care us about different parts of the developer experience that when combined is known as like the Stripe developer experience and what we offer to developers as our product. So I, I would say that, that today that's just like one element of Stripe because the reality is that 
for a large platform like ours, like developers are just one segment today. We also have like many users that are just using Stripe to run their business. I'm a founder of a company somewhere in the world. What do I do? I open the Stripe app on my phone and I can get an overview of, of the payments or I go to dashboard.stripe.com to run my business. So I think it really also depends and through that lens of like who your audience is, etc. We at Stripe, we are still definitely a, a developer first a company that cares deeply about developers, but at the same time, we also care about more kind of people than just developers. Yeah, yeah, okay. I really like this holistic approach. It's not just a certain type, of persona and it's definitely not just a certain perspective on a word whether it's infrastructure whether it's experience like we do say developer experience but we are thinking about the experience in the broader sense and that is i think important to underline you reference another very good blog post by sean swix wang the radiating circles of dx architecture and he there's a few sentences which caught my attention but this was the first one most companies will ship the developer experience of their org charts. That's a very interesting one. It's like Conway's law applied to developer experience. What do you think about that? I think that's probably true. And I think broadly about our developer experience, there's probably a lot of companies that are not truly developer first in the sense that they run a traditional product and then they kind of bolt on this platform on the side and they they like they have like a little team put together developers.company.com and then they have a developer platform. So I definitely think in, in the sense that for a lot of companies, you running a developed part of, of your product, that's kind of an afterthought. And I, I do think that's kind of like a part of a broader symptom in terms of like kind of like as we know, like the most successful products are also or platforms are also the ones that are used internally. And you really have a strong feedback loop. So I do think in the sense that why it's so rare for, for to see truly exceptional developer first companies is that because it's kind of an afterthought. It's kind of like an easy way to kind of get open up for some integrations, etc. So shipping the org chart, yeah, I definitely think that's true. Also, there's an element of this in terms of like, if you don't have product teams that really understand developers and really focuses on developers as they're the main segment they care about, then you end up with an engineering team that's like, no, no, I want an API for this, and then they ship it. And then the rest of the product team is hyper-focused on uh, the typical customer segment that they care about. So you end up seeing like various fractions of the company and the org chart shipping components, and you don't have that holistic perspective on what does it actually take for us to be successful to go after this developer in this size company in this market, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's nobody's job. That's the problem. Developer experience is nobody's job. And then, you know, whether you're an engineer, whether you're, you're a product manager, whether you're a salesperson, whatever your role is, it's niche. It's just a small part of what really matters. So, Coming back to the things that matter, uh, Sean has this really interesting representation and it just helped me understand the relationship between product, docs, content, and community. So there's the outer shell, the community. How do you think of the community that you have, the Stripe community? I, I, like, I think about our developer community. We're doing a lot of different things and I'm, I'm just like paraphrasing like in terms of like what our, our wonderful developer advocates and our, our folks that are focused on that are doing but if you think about the community we have today is that we have like advisory boards where we have a community of developers we are running and um, things like um, support for on discord uh, stripe has been known for quite a while that i think we had one of the longest running ioc channels where everyone would be be able on free note people could join in and, and answer questions we do like meetups we speak at conferences we do like uh, we have a, a very active like youtube community where we have like product teams like some of, of my teams uh, where we, we do monthly broadcasts and say like, hey, we're working on this feature, getting feedback, etc. So what we're really trying to do uh, broadly is trying to have like an interactive community where it's a two-way feedback channel is that I want to learn about some of the needs for my customers and I want to build the right set of things and we want to engage on multiple fronts. And I think that's probably an element where a lot of like companies are thinking like developer 
community and developer advocacy mainly as like a marketing channel. And to me, it's also like a very basic like customer development channel. It's my community of people that are using my product. I, I want to solve their problems. I want to build the right set of things, etc. So to me, like community is like it's kind of both ways. Is that it's a way that we can enable like our product teams, our engineers, to talk to customers, and the other way around. Yeah, yeah. I also think that's super important. That is your interface, if you wish, to the users. And it's not the product. Most people think it's the product. Sure, to some extent, of course, right? Because they have to interact with it. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, like that's that's where everything starts. But it's people talking to other people, people that are maybe not Stripe employees, people that, you know, have a good experience, have a bad experience. All they come together and what do they do? How do they help each other or not? What is the content that they find? By the way, that's like the second layer. There's the community, there's the content, and that's how that's what they interact with, right? Because each of these people, they create lots of content, whether it's questions, whether it's answers, whether it's YouTube videos, whatever it is, they create a lot of content, applications maybe even, because going back to Stripe apps, how to use them, so on and so forth, blog posts like this one. And then there's Docs, right? And Docs is very close to the product uh, now. Would you say that not having docs is an option? There's an API, it's self-documenting, that's okay. Go with that. Do you think that's enough? N no, not at all. And also like the, the way I go about building docs for my product is that they're part of the product. Every time you ship a new feature, you also write the docs. And frankly, like when you build great products, you actually start with the documentation. I'm, a, I'm personally a big, big believer in like writing the docs first or like doing it to like Amazon style PI FAQs that you write the press release. What do you want to be true when this product is successful? Then you work backwards from that. And a lot of times like, like I can kind of like draw on previous, previous experience here, but like when I was at, at Microsoft and we were building VS Code, like the way we would be building VS Code is that we did monthly iterations. And, and duration would then end up being three weeks of product development, so engineering, design, et cetera, and one week of polishing. And in that week, we as a collective team, we would be writing the documentation, writing the blog post, fixing all the issues. And then after that week, collectively, then we are ready, we're putting the release notes together, and then we press the button. And it would be me as a product manager, I would be writing the documentation together with everyone on the team, regardless of like whether you're a designer, engineer, engineering manager, we all be writing that documentation together. We would have like a wonderful technical writer that to make sure that the tone and all these things, and he would basically just do a draft and polish of it, but it'd be written by the team. So the very engineer that worked on a particular feature would also write the documentation. Uh, they would also do the animated GIF we would use on Twitter. If I were to like provide it as a, as a product manager perspective of why we do this, I would draft a blog post in that week and then we would press the button. So to me, this is really about like docs and also you engaging with the community. That's a part of you building a product. And that's also why I think like the way I look at developer experience, and that's also something I'm touching upon in my blog post, is that right now I'm seeing this industry movement of like developer relations teams being relabeled as developer experience teams. And I don't think that's the right way to think about developer experience because if developer experience is holistic experience that goes across docs, content, product, community, you have to think about what that holistic journey is and how you're empowering your team, your DX team to solve those pieces. Typically, a developer relations team is mainly focused on like content writing, community speaking at conferences, et cetera, they are not incentivized and they don't have like, I would say the right leverage to really change product too. So that's why like it kind of like DevRel and, and, and your product team kind of say yin and yang, you have, you can have great content when you have a great product and the other way around. So, so it's really about thinking about like all the pieces that comes together to provide that great uh, developer experience. Yeah. The way I understand it is that DevRel is a slice of all the layers. You can't say, I'm just community and content. No, no, there's the docs and there's the product. And if you don't operate across all those layers, then you could be doing better. You could be improving. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I, I see it like you providing the best possible product experience you can. It's a team sport. It takes a lot of different disciplines. 
And usually when you think about organizations, you probably like, if you are a larger company, you probably have like a product team that is built into the core product itself. You have a different team focused on like more like the outbound kind of activities, but it's a team sport. Everyone has to come together to provide the best possible experience. And to me, this is the feedback loop is that a typical product team is sitting in the virtual office, writing code, doing PODs, doing designs. They're informed by talking to customers, they're informed by talking to the community. And your outbound DevRel function, that's really like your eyes and ears out there in the community. So you can get all the feedback to build the right things. And when you have a product, then your typical outbound shape DevRel team can then also go out and evangelize that, push it to the community, get the feedback, etc. But it's it's a collaborative nature. And I think at least traditionally how I've seen a lot of like DevRel teams being organized, I think that's changing now is that people think it's also the DevRel team building the product, but that's usually not the case. And usually DevRel teams don't have the right influence and incentive to actually make the necessary product changes. They can provide the feedback. So I also think that that's kind of like a structural change in the, that we're seeing now to your point about a modern DevRel team is a slice of everything and they can also do more than just samples. They can actually go and up, get the API updated. Mm, okay. Coming back to DX since that was our starting point, uh, you have some a nice list of table stakes for DX in 2022. Which are the items that you would like to shout out? They're all important, but if you were to focus on, let's say, three of those, which would be the top three? So I would, I would start by, by playing a bit back in terms of like, it depends on what kind of product you're building. I think if you're building like a API first external offered product, like let's say I'm building my, my weather API, I'm building a payments API. I think like you, like you internalizing that providing documentation is a part of the product you're building. It's, it cannot be an afterthought. You providing, having an element of like what I call or what we call surprisingly great in the sense that you have an rigorous attention to detail about how your product is put together. So that means when there's an error message, it's actually a helpful error message. It's not a random internal error code. Really having that level of like attention to detail and you've been putting yourself in the shoe of the developer because you've been dog fooding and integrating your own product. I'm considering that table stakes. And then we can kind of add a lot of layers on top of that. I think the other thing is, is the SDK experience. Given that the majority of your developers that are consuming your API, they will not sit and do raw curl requests or raw request with a web library. No, no, they will, they will expect to consume an SDK that provides a native experience in the framework on the programming language they use. And it's considered table stakes in 2022 that you uh, have that broad support, but also that you are more than just the baseline. Let's say if I'm providing an, an SDK for Node.js, what if then what if the majority of your developers are sitting in Next.js? What is that first class experience you provide? Or Python and Django, that kind of thing, right? So that you really have like that really tight integration to truly meet developers where they are. And I think that's probably like the, the meta narrative here is that you need to meet developers where they are in the stack they use, in the framework, in the abstractions, and on the platform. The reality is that like the gray matter developer or the 99% developer, they're probably sitting on a Windows box and not sitting on a $3,000 MacBook. You have probably also have a large proportion of your, your customer base that are sitting on Linux boxes, etc. So you really like have to like to truly meet developers where they are. You have to like do a range of different things for a lot of different platforms and abstractions. What did you find most surprising in your DX journey? Something that you weren't expecting? It was like, wow. I didn't realize this was that important. This is a good question. And like when, when you say like my DX journey, is that like I'm kind of putting on his product hat, thinking about developer experience and building that out? I, yeah, like I think like to, to, to the point that I now brought up a, a few times is that 
it took me to work at a large scale to really internalize that the majority of developers are not sitting at the bleeding edge. And that's probably my, my own personal bias coming from a background of working in startups, being hyper-obsessed and what's on Hacker News, always like scouting through Hacker News and GitHub, looking at like TechCrunch and always chasing like the, the, the new shiny thing. And then when you launch like an, a product and then you realize like, oh, oh, God damn it, I forgot about PHP. Or I forgot about like um, C Sharp and ASP.NET when we sold into this enterprise customer. So really looking beyond just like what's new and hip and really truly understand like who are your customers and what kind of tech stack are they on as you kind of like are providing a platform. Whether that is a platform that's exposed via APIs or it's a platform that you're providing where you have a, you're truly enabling people to build on top of you that I'm super focused on right now with apps and building like a foundational extensibility platform. Or it is that I am providing a code editor like VS Code that actually needs to run on a lot of different, uh, different platforms. And I think, yeah, like that has probably been the most surprising element. Uh, that in hindsight is like, yeah, naturally, why can it, why, why didn't you think of that? Yeah. But you, you just don't see that if you are focused on a, a, a very narrow, specific, specific niche. Um, is you only see that truly as you go at, at scale. Mm. Okay. That's, that's an interesting one for sure. It's interesting that the infrastructure is supposed to be reliable. It's supposed to be boring because that's what makes it reliable. It's supposed to be a known element. You would not put the latest shiny, the latest exciting at the core of your business, would you? I mean, that would not be very wise. <laughs> Brave, maybe, <laughs> but not very wise. I mean, maybe if you have like a, the blast radius, if you have that under control and you understand risk mitigation and you're doing experiments, sure, to some extent, but uh, that's interesting. Like, how do you do experiments at Stripe? How do you introduce new and exciting things while limiting the blast radius when things go wrong because they will right it's an unproven new tech i mean do you even do that i don't know yeah like i i actually think our cto dps uh, david he gave a really good keynote i think it was last year the year before you can probably dig it up we can put it in the show notes on youtube and some how we run product development how we do experimentation you're right about like us being a payments infrastructure company. We kind of like uh, the definition of like build boring things and do it well. And we as a company, we are much more conservative in terms of like how we run experiments, how we roll out things, et cetera. But what I talk about is like not necessarily the infrastructure we operate, but it's the integration of our infrastructure towards other platforms in a sense that, that it's very easy for you to build a, hey, I want to build like a authentication as a, a, as a service. And then you only focus on like the new kind of like really interesting loud segment on Hacker News. But the reality is most of your customer audience and your business opportunity is in a different world. And your job is to really help them move forward in the technology landscape. And that's your opportunity. Yeah. It is not to kind of help like the bleeding edge because they will probably roll their own, right? So it's really you to understand like that opportunity in the market and what role you play. Maybe your job is with the tool that you provide, whether I'm building a new like local de developer tool, I'm building a new infrastructure service. That, you, that is truly your audience. You have a unique opportunity. But for most infrastructure companies, even uh, even developer companies, your your opportunity is a long tail in bringing that forward. Mm -hmm. So I have two follow up questions. First of all, how do you find out? about that majority that you need to bring forward and then how do you bring them forward that depends right like i think i can look at this through the lens of like a company like stripe that is providing payments infrastructure what what stripe is, is doing is that we're kind of building a new abstraction layer to the financial system and we are helping traditional businesses that are not online they're not digital native to kind of go forward in this world we do that by going working with their businesses, really enabling them and saying, hey, like, are you doing retail payments? Maybe you can do that online, et cetera. So that's the element of like business development, so like what you can do here and what the tangible opportunity is and how you can help them bring them in into the digital world. Or you can look at it through the lens of productivity saying, hey, you're doing ID verifications, the old school manual way. We have a product that can kind of do, to do that for you, that kind of thing. 
when it comes to like developers and like what kind of tools and abstractions that they use, I probably see it as an incremental step change in the sense that you can start out by providing one surface area. You can help this PHP developer to offload some of the needs for from the database needs. They can go from a self-hosted database to do something like planet scale. And then you kind of stitch together and slowly kind of move them forward to where they might end up in a world and saying, hey, maybe I shouldn't be running uh, with the PHP stack, but maybe I should run like P- PHP in a serverless context on, on Vercel or something like that. So I probably see it like as, as that eventual progression to how you can add value. And I think it's a typically a fallacy to think about like what we do with our technology is that just because it's new technology that is valuable? No, that's probably not the case, right? Mm. Um, is that trade off constantly? What challenges do you see ahead for DX and DXI? There must be many. I mean, things are improving for sure, but there must be some big, big obstacles, like things that maybe the majority needs to understand or accept before the new big step can be taken or like the next big step can be taken. There's an element, uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind, and I'll probably think about more more things that I'm kind of talking out loud here. I think the main thing that is very top of mind for me is the balkanization of the internet in the sense that the world we're moving towards to is that as we kind of like, you could argue that we are the end of globalism and we are now moving into like a more balkanized world where we're moving towards a world where we have like the European internet, we have the American internet, we have the Indian internet, we have the Chinese internet that are probably going to more operate as isolated islands with their own set of infrastructure needs, with their own set of like uh, compliance and regulation about privacy, how data is moving, etc. What does that mean when we think about providing internet services and we think about providing developer-focused services? Because if you think about what has happened in the past decade or so, we have gone from, I'm running my own data center in Denmark or in Mumbai, and I have full control that we kind of offload that responsibility to cloud infrastructure providers and kind of abstract that away. So we don't think about the routers anymore, but we think in these high level abstractions. But what does that mean when I'm, let's say operating, I want to start a new shop tomorrow and I'm doing a, a pure API play. What does that mean that I'm now using these infrastructure in providers in between and now I have to navigate the complexities of how data is moving, different regulation, etc. So I, I think there's a lot of like unanswered questions as kind of like the internet and our industry is going from being somewhat the wild west to a more regulated world. I think that will have a profound impact on how we ship software and what kind of infrastructure and developer experience abstractions we are using. And I think like the first question that popped up in my mind here is that like in five years from now, would I sign up for a infrastructure provider that provides me service A or would I rather like have a deployment model where, no, no, they're not hosting it for me, but I'm buying the software, then I'm getting a Docker container and then I'm running out of my own Kubernetes cluster and I am responsible for running it in the five different zones of the internet. So I think there's some really interesting challenges that, that we haven't figured out yet. And what does it actually mean in terms of like data privacy and how do we figure these things out? So that's probably the first thing that, that pops up as a really big, profound change. And like, you just can't spin up like a service in Amazon anymore. Maybe Amazon will figure it out for us, but you as a company needs to understand these, this new kind of like world you, you're operating in. Yeah, I think... From an infrastructure perspective, how we used to design systems or how we still design systems for resiliency. Uh, We have regions, we have zones. uh, We try to avoid zones talking amongst themselves, sorry, regions talking among themselves, even zones, right, for egress costs, networking costs, bandwidth costs, things like that. I think there's going to be some challenges around the data. And also, it's not just for resiliency purposes, but also for regulation purposes. So in a way that can make things more resilient, but it will be a challenge to roll all those things, to upgrade, run the upgrades, and keep things separate, but at the same time have that holistic view how everything integrates because you don't want that fragmentation because it's just not great. Like you, 
imagine, and maybe even today that's the case, Stripe in India must be very different to Stripe in the US, right? Because of various reasons. Some of it is regulation. Europe as well, which was not the case until maybe several years back. And I see this fragmentation being balkanization, as you put it, being both a challenge and an opportunity. The opportunity being how do you design the developer experience that can be fragmented, but at the same time it's holistic. It feels like it's the same thing. It doesn't feel like it's two different companies, right? Or two, two different products. So that is definitely challenging. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think you're spot on in that regard. Like is that an opportunity in the sense that we will kind of see like new services emerge from cloud infrastructure that solves the, these needs or is this kind of like a moment in time where we, we are kind of pulling back in a sense that like we actually like reverting the back to like a more self-host model or we are reverting to a model that instead of software we buy an infrastructure we buy is hosted by default we have a kind of different uh, deployment model where you bring like the data plane of your, your offering behind your firewall, but you have like a centralized control plane that that's kind of like what you purchase. I think there are some, some really interesting questions. And I think, is it like, I think there is this company called Replicated that is like in, enabling any kind of SaaS company to provide like a self-hosted version by wrapping up your service in a, in a, in a Docker image. And then you can sell it so you can kind of sell like GitHub Enterprise and then what a product in Enterprise Edition. I think there's some interesting things that we haven't figured out. And also like you can kind of like tie it back to the developer experience and internal develop, developer productivity is that we spent the first decade moving our servers and our production environments to the cloud. What's happening now with internal develop, developer productivity is that we are now moving our local development boxes to a cloud-hosted development box. And now we're kind of moving some of our production services from the central cloud to the edge. So you can kind of see like the div box kind of tailing a bit behind. Also because like the local development environments become so complicated or complex and have so many dependencies that it's no longer feasible to run them, them locally anymore. So it's kind of, it's just an interesting progression. And I'm wondering if this is a point in time where we have to stop up and really rewire how we're doing a lot of these things. If we don't move the development environments from where they are, we keep them local, they're already on the edge. So <laughs> right, if you right. think about it, just don't move them. <laughs> By the time production moves to the edge, we are already on the edge. So it's okay. <laughs> All right. Tongue in cheek. Just a joke. To get to more important matter, as we are preparing to wrap up, what would you say is the most important takeaway for the listeners that stuck with us all the way to the end? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for sticking along for, for so long. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you're still here. If you're listening, I think the most important takeaway when, when, when we think about developer experience and developer ex experience infrastructure is that for you to provide a industry leading developer experience, uh, covering all the different aspects in the full life cycle. The reality is that you as a founder or company today is that you cannot build it in house anymore. You have to go out and pick some of these products that exist because otherwise you will be needing a significant internal investment that are spending hundreds of engineers for you to be successful. And this will take time and focus away from you building your core product that might be an API or something else. So I really think like we're seeing this point in time where the tables, the, the off the shelf offerings for all these different companies providing documentation, SDKs, etc., they're good enough that you can go and pick them off off the shelf and you can use it. And kind of my hypothesis is that I think this will kind of be the new default. If you are starting a company in two years from now, you will use one of these products that, that are providing aspects of your developer experience for you. You will not roll it yourself because you cannot build it yourself anymore. And you shouldn't. Much similar to how today we kind of take it for given that you will not go and build your, your own data center. You will not manage your own hardware. But you sign up uh, on Amazon or whatever cloud provider you provide. I think the defaults and the mindset, how we think about that kind of like outer layer of, of the developer experience, that is changing. It's like you, you should be focused on building the cake, but the icing and all, all the stuff on top that makes your service really easy, consumable, et cetera, you probably shouldn't be building that anymore. Mm. In other words, the value line has moved. Double check where you thought it was versus where it is right now. 
and uh, act accordingly. Because who wants to waste time? Who wants to feel like they're doing redundant work? Work that other teams have done much better. And if you think that you can do it better, well, unless it's your business, don't. <laughs> because it's a waste of time, most likely. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, well put, well put. <laughs> Thank you, Kenneth. It's been a pleasure having you on Ship It. Uh, I'm looking forward to next time. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful blog post. I'm looking forward to what you will do next. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. This was fun, and I hope we can find another opportunity that I can be back. For sure. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Ship It. Check out our other podcast for developers at changelog.com slash master. You can connect with like-minded developers via changelog.com slash community. Thank you Fastly for the worldwide low latency changelog.com. Our listeners love those blazing fast MP3s. Your Firecracker VMs and Edward Guard integration are really sweet flat at IA. That's it for this week. See you all next week for a final 2022 Kaizen episode. If you want to get a head start, check out GitHub Discussion 433 in our changelog.com repository.